if I wanted to do stab areas, stab movements to his penis, did you see anything consistent with a stab to the penis? Not to the penis itself, no. Because you saw what? It was nicked. It was a superficial cut. Super it was more of a slicing. Superficial slicings like this. Right. Okay. What a moment inside the courtroom. I will never forget it. That was the trial of Susan Wright, the woman dubbed the blue-eyed butcher. Guess what, folks? She's out of prison. She was convicted of murder back in 2004 after stabbing her husband almost 200 times. Now she's out on parole. Julie Grant gives us a look back at her case. terrified. That is the only feeling that I felt was that I was absolutely terrified. And you were terrified that you were going to get caught for what you've done. No, I was terrified that he was going to keep trying to hurt me. No. That was just some of what Susan Wright tearfully told the jury when she took the stand in her own defense during her homicide trial in 2004. That's a slice, isn't it? No, I did not sit there and nick at him. I did not do that. No. In 2003, the 27-year-old mother of two was accused of doing the unthinkable, stabbing her husband Jeffrey 193 times and burying him in their backyard in Texas. Rage, unbelievable rage. That pretty, smiling, blonde, beautiful face has a lot of rage behind it and we're never gonna know where it all comes from. Susan Wright's attorneys said Jeffrey made her life a living hell, beating her, kicking her, and raping her on a regular basis. He came across in public as being charming and being easygoing uh, and being a, a good guy, but that's not who he was behind that uh, wooden fence around the front yard of, of his and Susan's residence. Uh, behind that fence, he was a monster. Wright admitted killing her husband, but said it happened in self-defense because he was trying to kill her. Where did you stab him? <laughs> in his head, and in his chest, and in his neck, and in his stomach, and in his leg from when he kicked me. I stabbed him in his penis for all the times that he made me have sex and I didn't want to and I couldn't stop because he was going to kill me and I couldn't stop. But prosecutor said Susan seduced Jeffrey into allowing her to tie him up in their bed as part of a plan to murder him. Okay, now again holding the knife the way you said to him a little while ago to describe the face. This reenactment by the prosecutor became one of the most memorable moments of the trial. The bed where the killing occurred was reassembled in the courtroom, and the prosecutor climbed on top of her colleague during some of the witness questioning. Were all of these injuries in the chest area consistent with the knife being held in this direction? No. Okay, what's the difference? What else did you see? You see wounds where the uh, knife blade is what you would call horizontal, if we call this vertical. More or this horizontal. way. Yes, sir. But Wright's attorneys argued Jeffrey was not bound, saying that his wounds prove it. You don't get defensive wounds being tied up. You get defensive wounds by flailing your hands trying to get a weapon. State of Texas versus Susan Lucille Wright. We, the jury, find the defendant, Susan Lucille Wright, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. The jury convicted Susan Wright of murder, and she was sentenced to 25 years. After a successful claim of ineffective assistance of counsel, Wright received a new sentencing phase, resulting in 20 years. Now, at 44 years old, she's back home and on parole until 2024. Unbelievable case. Susan's right counsel was found ineffective at the first sentencing, as you heard, because they didn't call critical witnesses who could have supported her abuse claims. Let's talk more about this with Court TV anchor Julie Grant. Julie, great to see you. What a trial. Um, oh, yes. I know you spoke with one of her appellate attorneys, uh, Court TV's good friend, uh, Brian Weiss. Yes, I sure did, Vinny. Great to be with you. And yes, uh, Brian Weiss always enjoyed being on the original Court TV with you and uh, passed along his regards to you, Vinny. And yes, Brian Weiss was instrumental in allowing Susan Wright to get another sentencing phase because of what you mentioned, Vinny, because of raising that ineffective assistance of counsel claim that the attorneys at the trial level did not do what they should have done at her sentencing. And that was 
allowing the court to properly understand the domestic violence issues that were at play, the dynamic and the relationship between Susan and her husband, Jeffrey. And in particular, Brian Weiss argued that he would have called the psychiatrist who treated Susan and also an expert on what was known at the time as battered woman syndrome, now more commonly referred to as battered person syndrome. But the, it's a psychological condition that can develop in a person when they experience an abusive relationship. And Brian Weiss said in particular, it was the amount of stab wounds, the number that became so critical in calling those expert witnesses to explain. Here's a listen to some of what he told me. You have to put yourself in Susan's shoes and you have to view what happened that night through Susan's eyes. You can't flat out do that unless and until you recognize that Susan was the victim of monumental, systemic, and egregious abuse on multiple levels. And once you see how she acted and reacted, and once you can see what a psychiatrist tells you in terms of, of walking the walk and talking the talk, but if you have a legitimate expert in mental health who can set this to music, then you can begin to understand what motivated, what animated, what drove Susan Wright that night. Brian Weiss, as you know, Vinny, a very, very thorough, meticulous attorney, and he filed an ineffective assistance claim for also the guilt-innocence phase, which was denied. Uh, the sentencing phase is where it was ultimately granted, and she had that reduction in the number of years in the end. And he also filed a direct appeal as well, Vinny, as you know. Now, the demonstration in the courtroom where they brought in the bed mm -hmm. and the prosecutor um, gets on the bed, gets on top of her colleague, who is, I guess, tied up to the bed. Very controversial at the time. Judge allowed it. Um, but this was a, a, an issue on, a, uh, one of the issues on appeal. It certainly was, Vinny. This is a big one that Brian Weiss raised. And the trial lawyers at the time, uh, they did right by their client. They did object to this at the time on the basis of speculation, that it's speculative, that she couldn't have known how exactly Susan Wright did that stabbing, nor could those witnesses that she was questioning there that you see behind her. And so the judge ultimately overruled it, as we know, the bed, it was all assembled in the courtroom. And as I said, this was pursued on direct appeal. So here's a listen now to some more of what Brian Weiss told me about that. Not only was this something that, that Kelly Siegler seemed to be making up as she went along, something that she had created from whole cloth, but at the other end is that it was so unduly prejudicial that whatever probative effect, whatever value the jury might have been able to glean from it was far, far outweighed by the specter of unfair prejudice. And there is no way that, that anybody could have ever gotten that indelible, monumentally prejudicial image out of a juror's head of, of Kelly Siegler mounting uh, her fellow prosecutor and, and essentially uh, channeling Norman Bates in psycho. It was, just, it was wrong then. It's wrong now. Obviously, uh, the Court of Appeals and the Court of Criminal Appeals disagreed. He makes an excellent point, Vinny. You know, looking at that video, I mean, I have to say that may be the demonstration of all courtroom demonstrations. I think that really went down in court TV history, and we probably won't see anything like that ever again. Yeah. Uh, we did see something pretty close to that uh, out of Las Vegas. Margaret Rudin, the Black Widow, they also brought the bedroom into the well of the courtroom. It wasn't quite as wow. dramatic as that moment, but... And it, and it happened within a few years of each other, and it was like, wow, I, this is unbelievable uh, what lawyers are doing to try to, you know, bring the case to life. Um, right. Brian Weiss also talked about domestic violence and, and being such a big issue here. Let's, t let's take a listen to what he told you. It was emotional. It was physical. It was sexual. It was systemic. It was unconscionable, and it was egregious. And I, I hope... Uh, on some level, that, that Jeff's family has obtained closure with what happened to him. And, but at the end of the day, the, you know, the truth, particularly in the criminal justice system, Julie, is seldom simple and never easy. And, and the simple, difficult truth was that Jeff Wright was a bad guy. And, and Jeff Wright on that night became a clear and present danger to Susan. When I called one of our two experts 
on battered women syndrome. And I said, look, the judge wants to know, and the jury probably wanted to know, why didn't Susan just leave and get a protective order? And the expert looked at me and said, protective orders? Hmm. Bullets go right through them. You know, um, in this case, I mean, prosecutors made the argument that this was made up, this domestic violence. It didn't exist. It, it just appeared as part of the defense in this case. And she testified, right? So she gave a firsthand account from her perspective about what happened. Right. Correct, Vinny. She sure did. And that was something I talked with Brian Weiss in depth uh, about and it was her story. And he said, you know, I lived this case for six years. I lived it. He did pro bono work on the case. And he said, I am telling you, she was a victim. And domestic violence is one of those topics that's very hard to understand. It's very tricky. It's a tough topic to talk about, even to this day. I mean, we're fast forwarding so many years from the time that that trial took place. But yes, he said that was why it was so critical to understand what she was experiencing and how this killing took place. For anyone to just wrap their mind around how someone could stab their husband 193 times, she told the jury it was in self-defense that he was trying to kill her and that she managed to wrestle the knife away from him. And after all of the beating and the kicking and the raping that took place throughout their marriage, she had reached her breaking point. And so it's really a sad story. And the facts on the on its face don't always tell the full story, and you know that, Vinny. And once we get to the trial, you really and truly see both sides, as we did in this case. Absolutely, and she is free tonight. Julie Grant, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Vinny.